came. Of the seas, 
Will you then say, I am a God, in the presence of those who kill you? You will be but a man, not a God, in the hands of those who slay you. You will die the death of the uncircumcised at the hands of foreigners. I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. This is a second time. Son of man, take a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model, you were the signet or the, steep, the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with the violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuary. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. And I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who are watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Father God, we stand one more time in the midst of your holiness with this word in front of us and these people before us. God, now speak your word as only you can. Use it to help us understand what real revival is and let us not fall as those who have come before us but help us stand us up lord and make us have the right mind this mind which is also in christ jesus let it be in us in jesus name we pray amen, amen. you may be seated in his presence and i thank you for standing for that lengthy reading but 19 verses is not too long you know we stand for a lot longer amen Hey, Lord, uh -huh. we stand, we stand at the ball games, praise God. We stand at other places so we can Amen. hang out for the word of God. Amen. Amen. Lord, send a great revival in this place. Send a great revival. That, that's what my heart has been here for the last few weeks. And sermon one of two weeks ago, I do believe, was find the book. Amen. Find the book, read the book, and believe the book. Amen. You got to find the Bible. You've got to pick up the Bible. I had someone reach out to me the other day and said, Pastor, I've been challenged to put my phone down and actually pick up a real Bible and read it so that I'm not distracted. Amen. By the, the, the chimes and the dings and the snaps and, the, and all the other things. Amen. Sermon two last week was tear down the, the high places. Amen. Tear down the, the idolatrous places that sometimes we have built up in our lives and we don't even really realize it. Josiah, a great king, and there were none like him before and none after him. He, he, he tore down the high places. Today I want to preach to you today, if the Lord will allow me just a few moments, that there is an enemy of revival. In order for you to have revival, you must recognize there is a great enemy of revival. Now, I'm going to go ahead and warn you out ahead of time. This is not your typical revival sermon. Amen. As I begin to, to think about it and pray about, Lord, what would you have me to say? How can we close this out? I'm picturing in my mind a high time in the Lord and people uh, being revived in the Lord and, and people uh, raising their hands and praising God and understanding what revival is and the Lord clearly spoke this text to me Ezekiel 28 
as I read it, I thought, this is not what I had in mind, Lord. But move me out of the way, and you say what you want to say. Amen. And, and I know he will do that today. So when revival is announced, many times people hear we're going to have one. We put it in the announcements. We, we talk about it. We send out word. And, and I, I thought about that when, when it's announced, it, it is something that in my mind over the years, it has had the, a, sort of a mystique to the word. And, and if, if you can say it that way, it's, it's like, wow, this is going to be supposed to be something special. How about you? Have you ever thought that when you heard this church is having a revival, that church is having a revival? It is something that is supposed to happen that is an amazing thing. Historically, revival in our nation is nothing new. In fact, there was a, a historic period that some of you have heard about, those of you who are, are students and, and been around uh, Mr. Gene Huffman. He probably dressed up as, as a preacher or as a, a, a great minister, and he talked about the first great awakening. Amen. And America's first great awakening happened uh, shortly after, during the original colony, the colonist times, and it was sparked by a minister by the name of Jonathan Edwards, and he preached a famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the story goes that, that people were literally gripping the pews from conviction and the power of repentance that was happening from that sermon. Now, it's been a while <laughs> since I've seen anybody grip the pews from conviction. I, I don't know what that has to do with. I, I kind of have an inkling, but it's been a while. We, we, we are here now, but back then, in those days, they, they, the, 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 the history says that they were under such power of conviction that they were gripping the pews. The preachers wanted revival, and here was the issue. The colonists had, they, they believed, the preachers, that the colonists had, had separated or had fallen far away from the original intent of their forefathers. The pilgrims who came here with religious freedom in mind and, and God was there all in all. But since things had kind of gotten a little bit better, they had kind of fallen away. Amen. They, they, the, 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 the revival spirit, the, the, the power of God, so to speak, over this area, this country, it had kind of died off. So the preachers recognized that there was complacency and there was compromise. And so they began to preach these messages and it stirred the area all the way from the northernmost colonies down to the southernmost colonies. Then came the Second Great Awakening in the 19th century, and that actually happened somewhat in this area. It happened in southern Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, places like that. There were preachers that were itinerant pastors. They traveled by horse, and they went from place to place to place. As I studied about this, I heard that that bled over into areas such as Renville. Some of y'all know something about Renville up in here. Today. If you know anything about Renville, raise your hand. Amen. I figured it'd be a strong showing. Amen. We got we got a child of Renville up in here. Adam Clayton Powell Sr. was reported to have been saved during one of these revivals in these coal towns. Amen. They, somebody said the song, you said somebody would put up a tent. Uh-huh. In an, old, in an old field, in an old open field, people would come from miles around, traveling over rocks and reels. Amen. Very little money would be raised, but oh, so many souls were saved. They said there were souls saved in these revivals. People gave their hearts to the Lord. And I was thinking about the first great awakening and the second great awakening, and people have have questioned, has there been a third one? I, I don't really know, but, but here's what I do know. When there would be revival here in this church and other churches in the 90s, I thought about this long and hard, and I, I remember that there would be services, and it would be a week-long thing, and it was just regular church. 
There was singing. It was good singing. There was great preaching. There were prayers that were prayed. There was a great scripture reading. And there was a good testimony time. Yet, I, that's all I remember. I don't remember people coming through the doors. I don't remember people beating the door down saying, what must I do to be saved? Here, here's what I want to present to you. And just work with me. Pray with me, church. Here's what I want to show you. Could it be from the second awakening on up through America's biggest growth spurt that people kind of have put God on the back burner? And that revival then is not what revival meant in these last days. It was just a formality. You know, I, I'm just speaking for me. I can't speak for you. Some of y'all have been in revival, seen things. I haven't. But in my mind, there was, I was waiting on something a little bit more earth shattering. Now, today, I don't know about you, but you don't hardly hear too many revivals. There are things you hear over here, over there. Somebody's having one. But I, I don't know if it's true of what the scholars say. If some of them look at the idea that when you study the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, if you look at those churches chronologically, are we living in the Laodicea period? Yes, I know that was an individual church, but are we living during that moment when the Lord himself said in red print, you make me sick. You make me want to spew you out. You make me want to vomit you out of my mouth because you are neither hot nor cold. Amen. And even this, he says concerning this church, I'm at the door knocking. I used to hear that scripture. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I thought, wow, that's an invitation. No, no, Jesus is saying, I'm knocking on the door, trying to get into the church that I paid for. Amen. Read it. So can revival happen? Can revival happen in a church where Jesus is on the outside trying to get in? Now, when I say church today, don't think specifically of Pink Creek. I'm using that word in a broad term, but also, as, as the old folks used to say, if the hat fits, wear the shoes too. God will do what he wants to do, church. Now, I've asked him to revive us. I've asked him to send a great revival in our souls. I've asked him for first personal revival in each one of your lives. I, I have prayed for you, but I want to admonish you. I stopped by just real fast today to tell you there is an enemy of personal and corporate revival. This scripture, this text bears it out uh, today. It, it shows who this enemy and how this enemy works. Amen. Many early colonists believed that America was a country that was providentially created by God to bring the gospel to the nations. And if you read our history, in fact, it's in our history, it's in our historical documents, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. In order for you to be created, there's got to be creator. And if there's a creator, then guess what? He's the same one in the Bible that had to take an animal and slay it in order to cover man's sins. And if he did that, he also is the same one that sent Jesus. Amen. The root of the gospel is there in some of our historical documents. But watch this. How far have we fallen because of this great enemy of revival that now we have nations, the nations of the world coming to us to bring us the gospel? Amen. Did y'all catch that? Amen. There are thousands of missionaries here in America from foreign countries evangelizing us. That should make your heart sad. Our country is so far removed from God in her pride that we have forgotten about the one who gave us birth. We got his name on our money that we want to spend, but we don't honor him in our hearts that he has given us. In God we trust. 
I want you to know in some foreign nations, before we get to the text, watch this. You got folks, you got folks that will travel six hours on bus, six hours using machetes to get, and, and hours upon hours to get through the jungle to get to church. And sometimes you got folks in America that live across the street from one and will not darken the door. Can I say it this way? We are a proud nation. And pride today is defined not as feeling a, a, a healthy sense of accomplishment. There's nothing wrong with being proud of what you've done. Amen. I was finally able to get my, my lawn right, and I looked at it, and I was a little bit proud. But that pride did not supersede God. It was after I got through cutting, I wish I had a witness. I said, thank you, Jesus, for giving me strength to push the mower. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a little bit of cash to put some gasoline in that red pen. And, and thank you, Jesus, that your grass is still green. I got it in proper perspective. Tell your neighbor, pride is the enemy of revival. Amen. Pride causes you to have desires of revenge. Pride causes you to use your finances in a poor manner. Pride causes you to have anger issues. Pride ruins revival because it takes and tries to make God a secondary, if not at all, subject of a small g God. Proverbs 16, 5 says, everyone that is proud in their heart is an abomination to the Lord. And though you shake hands, I'm going to put it in my own words, he will not leave you unpunished. Though you're in agreement, though you're unified, shaking hands, if you're lifted up in yourself, if you're too proud of yourself, if you are operating under a prideful manner, God will bring you down. Psalms 10.4 says the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in his mind or his thoughts at all. Scripture bears this out in the text today. You got two people that are mentioned here. I want to point out first if you looked at the text in chapter, chapter 28 verse 1 and then you look at the text in verse, I do believe verse 11, verse 12. It says here first, the prince of Tyre, and then it says the king of Tyre. Now, what, what was Tyre? Amen. What, what was Tyre? Tyre was a rich trade city that was somewhere between Assyria and Egypt, and it was in competition with Judah. Now, back it up for just a moment and understand this, that if you remember last two weeks' sermon, this area where Tyre was was a part of the original Canaanite area that if Israel would have done what God told them to do, they would have possessed the land and it would not have been an issue. But because they went in and did what God did not tell them to do, and they let the Canaanites still stay up in there and have their idols, eventually Tyre became a fortified city that was on two different areas. One was on the back side of the coast, and the back half of the city was out on an island. Amen. Israel didn't tear down the high places. You see the connection? And so Tyre, this great city, is in two sections. One on the mainland, one on the islands, and, and on the island. And they are able to receive trade. You read the word trade in your text. So it was very hard to surround and attack this city because you had to deal with some water. So in verse 1, we see in this text, most importantly, it says the word of the Lord came. We can stop right there and have church if you wanted to. We need to praise God when the word of the Lord comes. And it's here today. He's here today. He's given somebody a word. So I praise God when the word of the Lord comes. Ezekiel writes, he records, the word of the Lord came. And it says, address the prince. Of that time, the Prince of Tyre. Amen. And his name, according to history, this is interesting, is Ethbel. 
E-T-H-B-A-A-L. Interesting enough that that last part of his name is the name of a false god, Baal. And no kawinky dink up in here, this man, F. Baal, uh, pretended to be divine. In his pride, he thought, I'm the sum of everything. I, I have made things. I have achieved things on my own. Now, stop for just a moment. I realize everybody in here, maybe just a few of you, there's been one at least one day in your life. Come on, y'all. When you thought, I'm it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've said this before. You, you pass by the mirror. And you did that, some of you men. Come on, y'all. Mr. Gay, Mr. Jarrell, Gene knows what I'm talking about. You flex those, what are they, bro, Gene? Triceps? See if they move? Some of you ladies, you went back and. Yeah. Come on, y'all. I'm it. That's what he said. I'm, I'm the son. It don't matter what you add together, but when you get to the equal sign, I'm on the other side. That's what he said. In verses 1 and 2, here's to read it again. He says, man, this is the dialogue. He says, man says, I am a God. Watch it how it flips. But God says, you're just a man. Let's stop right there. We, that's the problem today. Man says, I, I'm a God. And God has been saying, no, you're not. I, you, I was there when I made you. <laughs> when I made you, you, you were just dust. And, the, and the, God formed man from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into man the, the breath of life, and man became a, a living soul. Y'all ain't helping a brother out today. Man says, I am God. God says, you are just a man. Can I tell you some truth today? We are just sub-creators. Tell your neighbor to call him a name today. You ain't nothing but a sub-creator. Hey, man, you, it's okay to say it. You ain't calling him nothing, man. You ain't, you ain't nothing but a sub-creator. Now, you a good sub-creator, amen, because I know somebody in here can take a little bit of something and mix me up a great meal. She's a sub-creator. But ain't never not one of us in here a creator. Well, 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 what's the difference, preacher, since you're so smart? Well, what's the difference? Here it is. Sub-creators take stuff that's already been made and make stuff. But my Bible tells me in Genesis 1-1 that there's only one creator that can take anything, can take nothing and make something. James 4-6 says, but he giveth for grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Ezekiel is writing here to this proud prince. He's giving God's words, and he's saying, you're just a man. Verses 3 through 6, here is the holy sarcasm of God. God says, are you like Daniel? Evidently, uh, this is around the same time, and the, the, the fame of Daniel, who was able to tell of great kings, of their dreams and reveal their thoughts to them. He said, are you like Daniel? Are you wise like Daniel? Has, has your wisdom caused you to amass great wealth and riches? God's asking him a question he already knows the answer to. You're not Daniel. F. Baal, you, you, the prince of Tyre, you, you're not Daniel. You're not wise. And notice what the Lord says in, in verse 5. And he begins to point out three things that are necessary for us to get to where revival is. If we're going to get to real revival personally, corporately, then here's what has to happen. Amen. We must understand first and foremost that pride, which is the enemy of revival, begins in your heart. Amen. Amen. The heart, which is the representative the mind, the soul of, of this trichotomous individual that each one of us that we are. We are made up of, of spirit, mind, and soul, and body. There have been times over my years 
of teaching that I have begun to teach a lesson and I can tell there were some kids who were not paying attention. Amen. Just a few times. <laughs> and generally one of the reasons that kids may not pay attention, watch this, is because they feel they already know what you're teaching. We learned that last year. Amen. There are times, and, and you know what? If we're not careful, we can be like that in our hearts. Preacher, you're not telling me anything. Teacher, you're not telling me anything I don't already know. Well, let me tell you how this works. After we got done with the lesson and went through the review, and there came a paper or a test, you hand it out, it comes back in, and a lot of times, those who said, I already know that, they had a lot of ink on their paper. Can I ask you this this morning? How much ink is on your spiritual paper? How many times have you said, I already know what you're preaching about. I got it covered. I know this. I'm good. I don't need to really hone in, pay attention. Let me tell you something. That is a mark of pride. If something that is said, you feel like you can't use it. Amen. But on the flip side of that, sometimes I've been on the other end. Speaking of students, I was not always a teacher, I was a student, and there were times that I would sit in my seat, and I knew I didn't understand, but I would not raise my hand. Why? I was too proud. Too proud to let people know around me that I don't bit more know what this teacher's talking about. Then I'm, as my mom used to say, then a man in the moon. <laughs> now let get this, get this, get this, get this, watch this. There were also others around me. As we got to the parent-teacher conference, <laughs> and there was about five, six, seven parents lined up in a row, and they got to talking one evening. My mom made me go with her. I'm sitting there like. <laughs> and they got to talking. And here's what we found out. All their kids didn't know what they were talking about. And all of us in there were too to raise our hands. Do you understand this today? That pride begins in the heart. Pride begins with thoughts. Pride begins with emotions. And when you remember that you are your own God, that's when you start having problems. When you start thinking, I'm my own God, I, I don't need to ask questions. Nor do I need to be asked questions. I know what's going on. I've got it all covered up. In fact, I've got the world in the bottle and the stopper in my hand. Can I tell you something today? Real honest. Here's what I found out. In 48 years of living, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. I need the Lord. How about you? How about you? You see, F.B.L., Prince of Tyre, several thousand years later, he has fallen for the same lie of Satan that you can be a God. You are a God. He, he has fallen for that. And so the Lord begins to tell him some things. Look at this. In verse 6, he says, you think you're wise. Here's how I know you think you're wise. Because number two, not only will pride come out in your heart, but also pride comes out in how you talk. Lord, have mercy on us today. Uh, he says, I am a God. That's what it says. But notice this, Luke 6, 45, Jesus says the good person out of the good treasure of their heart produces good, but the evil person out of his treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. My pastor would say it this way. He would say, and you've heard it, what's in you will eventually find its way to the surface. And it will come out just like a, a bubbling volcano, a, a, a getting ready to erupt. It, it will eventually work its way to the surface. Amen. Signs that you might have pride in your speaking, pride in your life, is when you have the need to always offer everybody in your vicinity your advice. Lord have mercy. I, I, I'm trying to come down the aisle just straight down the middle today. I'm not trying to come in the pew and sit beside you. But if I get there, just say amen. 
Amen. Amen. My dad used to tell me, Christian, you need to learn to be seen and not heard. Because he wanted me to understand that I didn't always need to be talking. Amen. If, if he didn't quite get it that way, I heard a song a little bit later that had been out a few years before. It said, talking loud but ain't saying nothing. A lot of folks today got advice going on, but they're proud. It's out of the abundance of their heart. Can I stop by real quick and tell you, you better be careful who you're listening to online. All these websites, there's a lot of folks giving advice, and it's out of the abundance of their heart. You need to find the book and get the best advice. Amen. A lot of folks talking loud ain't saying nothing. Right. Millions of folks online giving advice ain't saying nothing. It, it's a problem when you got a pride problem. Not only that, but here it is. You can notice it. Check yourself. I even checked myself. Here's how you know when you got a pride problem is when you talk about yourself more than you talk about the one who saved you. Andre Crouch said it this way years ago in a wonderful song. He said, and if I gain any praise. Let it go to Calvary. With his blood he has saved me. By his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. I have nothing to say about me. I, I need to learn to get me out of the way and let my conversation be about the Christ who saved me. Pride, look at the text. Pride not only affects your speech. He said I'm a God. Pride not only affects your heart, but then pride will affect your actions. In a way, you can say it this way. Pride will affect your feet. Pride goes from here and travels all the way down, whether you're six foot eight or four foot eight. It'll make it to your feet. <laughs> yeah, it will. My mother used to tell me the peacock is a beautiful bird. <laughs> That's where that phrase comes from. Proud. As a peacock. Peacock strut. But then she would always ask us to say, until he bends over and looks at his feet. <laughs> Amen. And feet are scaly and ugly. Pride. Don't be looking at nobody's feet. Pride causes you to avoid those you feel are beneath you. Pride, come on church, will affect your actions. I'm not going over there. Amen, flip it. What if it were you over there and somebody else was where you are? I'm not speaking to them. They, they, we don't say it, I know that, but sometimes we think it. Do I, do I, do I have a witness that you can say in your pride is the enemy of the gospel. You can't evangelize correctly if you can't go to folks because you don't want to associate with them. Amen. When you disregard the advice of others and you need constant attention and you are unable to receive correct instruction and when you think that everybody else is down here and you have arrived, you might have a pride problem. God told Adam, Adam, be careful of that tree. It will give you pride problems. Amen. Noah preached, the Bible says, righteousness for almost 120 years. People passed him by, passed him by. Why are you building a boat, Noah? Can I put it in Christian commentary? Why are you building a boat in the middle of dry ground? He kept putting that pitch on. He kept playing in those boards. He kept doing what the Lord told him. And then pride got those folks when the first drop smacked them on the top of their heads. And even then it was too late. Pride got Pharaoh when Moses kept telling him, let God's people go. And the Bible says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pride affects your actions, making you think you have sure Footing when you know your footing is unsure. Pride will cause you to build your house on sand 
when you know you're supposed to be building it on the rock, which is Christ Jesus. Yeah. Pride calls F by L yeah. to fall. Yeah. Ezekiel delivers this message to him. And then he says, and this will be what will happen to you. Verses 6 through 10, he says, swords will be drawn. Amen. Death will come. Those of you who are, 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 are thinking you're high and mighty, you will die the death to foreigners. And do you all know, do you believe it, that history proves that the Bible is true? If you try to find the ruins of Tyre today, that's exactly what you'll find. Ruins. Amen. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar overtook the city. It took him 13 years, but he did. And then they tried to rebuild. And later, Alexander the Great figured out the great problem of how to attack an island. He literally took the rubble of the city and piled it in the ocean and created a bridge out to the island and destroyed it. God's word became true. In fact, Jesus spoke of Tyre in Matthew eleven twenty one 21, when he said, Woe to Bethesda and Chorazin, if the mighty works which are done of you would have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented a long time ago in sackcloth and ashes. Jesus knew that it just took Tyre, the king of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, that is, just a moment to repent and turn, but he would not. Now, who's behind this? Who keeps people from repenting? I'm, I'm about finished. Watch this. Notice what happens in verses 12 through 19. It goes from shifting from talking about the prince of Tyre to the king of Tyre. Amen. And God now addresses the power behind the man. Amen. He said, and it's no, no mess up here. God was just talking to the prince of Tyre. He said, you're just a man. But if you're reading the text like I am in verses 12 through 19, this is not referring to a man. The king of Tyre, my friends, my sisters and brothers, is Satan himself. Look at the description. He says, Satan, it doesn't name me, but it says, you were an anointed cherub angel in charge of the glory of God. Do y'all get that? Satan was a Lucifer in heaven. He was in charge of all of God's glory. Just the same as man had the right to choose. He, we have the right to choose. Satan also had that same right. And he chose to rebel against God. Notice God says here through Ezekiel, he said, when you were created, you were perfect. When you were created, you were right. And notice this, God gives every created being a choice. Watch this. God wants willing worship. Uh, I, I, know I'm, I know I'm about done, but I'm going to take my time for just a second. He doesn't want you to be poked and prodded into worship. He wants willing worship. I shouldn't have to tell you to say amen. Amen should come out of you because what's in I shouldn't have to tell you to clap your hands. We, we shouldn't have to ask you to stand up. We shouldn't have to ask you to praise God. That's on you. God wants, say it, he wants willing worship. So pride comes from the heart. Verse 13, he said, Satan, you tried to usurp God's throne. And it literally says it also in his Isaiah that I will exalt myself. So he was lifted up in pride. Notice in verse 13, God described Satan, said he was perfect. He was beautiful. He was in charge of the worship of God. He was a singer. He was a songwriter, y'all. He was a musician. Y'all want to hear some music? I bet you he could cook it up. Why do you think music is so possessing? Verses 14 and 15, he was an anointed guardian. Notice what it says. He was anointed. He was guardian. He was holy. He walked in the spirit. He walked amongst the fire of God. He watches. He was blameless. And then what does it say? Until wickedness was found in him. Isaiah says he, I will ascend. I will place my throne above the stars of God. 
Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from the sky. God pronounces judgment on Satan. One day all the nations, verses 17 and 19, will see him bow and then see him cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, uh, verse 10 says, there is such a place as the lake of fire prepared for Satan. Now here's the deal. It was prepared for him. It was never prepared, prepared for none of us. But once again, can I tell you, everybody has a choice. Amen. You either choose, as Satan did, to follow after your own lust, your own desires, the pride of life to rebel against God. Why do you think there's so much riots and hate and chaos and disobedience? Because the original rebeller is behind it. So where does that leave us, church? Here it is. Churches have been inundated with a spirit of pride. Yes. That's the reason why revival sometimes seems like it's in the sludge. Wheels spinning. Amen. Seems like we're just spinning our wheels. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Then Galatians 6 3 says, For if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he tricks or deceives himself. I want to let you know if there's any prideful way, starting with me all the way to the back door and in the overflow, watch this, then you need to get rid of it. You will never experience a true personal revival if you don't move pride out of the way. If you don't say, God, get it out of my way. Lord, help me with this. Lord, move this out of my way. And revival is personal, but so is pride. Amen. 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 You see, we live in a world today where literally people are so proud that they have taken, whether it's right or wrong, they have taken falsities and said, I believe that this is true and this is what I'm sticking to. They're so proud. This is the country we live in that people are making their own realities. Where do you think reality TV came from? Mm -hmm. And many folks stay home to watch reality TV. Proud. Sinners need to be called to repentance to a close, personal relationship with Christ. My friends, my sisters and brothers, hear me in this last few moments. Revival is personal. And, and I do believe it could lead to another great awakening. But folks gotta wake up and smell the coffee. Yes. Amen. And say, there are things in me that I know are not right. I need to release the pride. They say that there are cities around our country where revival is happening. I don't know. I've not been there and seen it, but I so bad and so desperately want to see it here. I want to see it here. I want to see it in each one of you. And as I said several months ago, if this is the Lord's final altar call, let us be a part of it. I'm asking you today, I, 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 I don't have any flowery words, but I'm asking you today, will you be a part of the Lord's final altar call? Will you be one of the ones that help to take the cap off here at Pink Creek, amen, in Gallipolis, that when they see and they see you, they, they hear you, you, they know that Jesus lives deep down on the inside. There's not any question. There's not any a question mark over your head or wondering. They sure enough know you've been born again and delivered, saved by the power of God. It depends whether revival happens on this powerful enemy we face. It is literally smothering. He is smothering our country with pride. Broad is the way 
that leads to destruction. But narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And here's the part that should really grab you, should concern you. And few there be that find it. <laughs> the downward road is crowded with unbelieving souls that cannot get free of their pride. They, they, like Adam, have fallen and they are in Adam and they challenge what God is saying. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in the Bible. They have no time for that. That is a pride thing. That is you saying, I want to be my own God. Let me live my life. Here's what I found out. I don't have a life to live if it's outside of God. Amen. God is my life. God is my salvation. God is my rock. God is my strength in my storm. God is my protector. How about yours? God is my food. He is my water. He is bread in a starving land. God is everything to me. God is joy in the time of sorrow. Hallelujah. God is the only hope that any one of us have for tomorrow. God is. He is everything. I'm not too proud to beg him and ask him that he let revival come up and down these hours. I'm not too proud to beg to say, Lord, we need you in this place. God, we gotta have you. God, you, you gotta come by today. Somebody needs delivered. They're all over the streets. They're all walking up and down the streets, but God is the strength of your life if you're but trusting even when the wicked, my enemies, came upon me to eat up my flesh. They stumbled and fell. Why? Because God is my protector. Isaiah 43 says, God is my salvation. How do you know that, Christian? Because I read the book one day and I found out, I found out that God sent his only begotten son. Amen. His name is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus in Philippians 2.5. He took on the form of a servant. He was not too proud. He came all the way down through 40 and two generations. He died on a Friday. He bowed his head in the locks of his shoulders. He allowed men to place him in the ground. But early on this Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. Hallelujah. Too proud to let somebody know. I know him. How about you? I know him in the free pardon of my sin. Don't you be too proud today to say, I've got some issues. I've got some things that need worked out. Here's my life, Lord. Take it and make it what you want it to be. Personal revival starts with you. Hallelujah. As the musicians come, personal revival starts right now. Not looking up and down the roads, not wondering what's happening at home, not trying to get to the mall all the time, but you bow in your head and say, God, fix me, fix me, work on me, strengthen me, take stuff out of me that does not need to be. Help me to release my pride. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. As you stand. Jesus is beckoning for us to come. Yes. Revival begins with you. It starts with me. It doesn't have to be some earth-shattering event. No. Hallelujah. I've had revival right in my little crowded, junky study at my house. I got one little path with all them books. But you know what? But, hallelujah. 
Hey, Lord, at the top. Amen, hey, God. Between those books, me and the Lord, we have a good time. Let revival start with you. Let revival start with you. Praise God. Hallelujah. He is speaking to somebody today. Don't be too proud. Don't be like the prince of Tyre. You're not a God. You're just a man. A just a man, just a woman who needs Jesus. You need him every day. You can't live without him. You can't walk without him. you got to have him. Your family needs him. You're, you're on your job. You need him. Give your life. Release your pride. Let revival begin with you. God, we thank you for this sermon series. We have done what you told us to do, God. Now, hallelujah. The rest is up to you. Your time, your way, do what you see fit. Praise God. And I know you'll do it right. Let us come before you in the right way. Let this church be a beacon of light in these last and weary days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The doors of the church are open. The altar. Amen. Get to it if you want to. It's open. If not a front pew or just down front. If you have something you want to tell the Lord today, we're not going to ask you to speak on a microphone. We're not going to ask you to say something out loud. But if you've got something in you, you know that you need to let go. And you're asking God, amen, I'm asking you just to come forward and we will pray with you right now. Now, if you're all right, you'll stay where you are. But if you're not, amen, you'll meet me down front today. Because I know where I am. I know what I need. I know where the Lord is leading me. I know what he said to me. Don't be too proud. Come. If he's calling you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. As you bow your heads. If there are any others, you may come. If not, extend your hands in this direction. Amen. Pride is the great enemy of revival. Pride keeps people from seeing themselves as they are. Pride keeps people from seeing God as he is. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. God, we thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for those who are gathered here in this place. And Lord, we ask that you touch each person from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Glory to God in Jesus' name. Lord, touch them, bless them, anoint them. Let them know that you have not left them. You are still right here. You are doing great things, God. Let them release those things that keep them back. Even those that are still in the pews. Those who are watching online. Whatever it may be. Help us. All of us. To not be so proud that we don't seek you first. There is some, some prince of tire in all of us. Help us Lord. Help us Lord. Clean us up. Clean us up. Clean us from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. Clean us, God, in Jesus' name. We need you in this church. We, we are seeking you in this church. We, we want you, Lord. We want you to come in. You are welcome here, God. Pull the cap off. Stop letting us just be so complacent in what church is. Church is not what we think it is. Church is when the living God meets with his people moment after moment where we say, I can't get a breath without you giving it to me. Hallelujah. Depend, depend. We need to depend on the Lord. In Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, go glory to God. Hallelujah. Lord, speak, Jesus. Speak. Speak to hearts. Speak to those who are concerned about family members. Speak to those who are in need of, 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 of a life change, a, a life movement, God. Whatever it is, speak to those who have questions in the corners of their minds. Speak to those who are concerned about loved ones who are sick. In Jesus' name, give some release today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Glory to God in Jesus' name. 
All of God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise God as you go on back to your seat. Praise the Lord as you go on back to your seat. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you all who came from the back. Praise the Lord. said to you, all I can say is listen. Amen. 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 We thank God for your presence here today. We pray that the spirit of revival, just because the sermon series is over, does not mean revival Amen. It is. Amen. Amen. I still believe God and I know God is working under the surface. <laughs> you don't know a volcano is going to erupt until it does, but that does not mean that all the while something was not happening under the surface. Amen. I can't always see it, but with the eyes of faith, I believe God has something for us. Yes. Trust him. Yes. Let go of your pride. Yes, sir. And let go and let God. Yes. Lord, we thank you one more time. In Jesus' name, bless now. Touch those who were here, those who wanted to be here, those who uh, just left, Lord, those who are on their way home, give us traveling grace. Bless the youngest to the oldest and everyone in between. Now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, and the love of Christ rest from our body over each one of us now, henceforth and forevermore. And all of God's people say amen. amen. Say amen again like you mean it. Amen.